Hello everyone, I'm your host Jerry Dean Lund and today on Enduring the Badge is firefighter Wes Scott. 20 plus years of experience in the fire service and he's going to leave you some great tips on how to get prepared to go to work and even more important, how to come home and be ready to engage with your family. Wes, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, your uh, childhood, your family and what about your hobbies too? So I grew up in Broomfield. I'm a Colorado native, born and raised, been here my whole life. Uh, grew up in a, in a pretty standard household. You know, mom and dad stayed together all the way through the end. Um, we moved a couple of times. I went to Broomfield High School and graduated there back in 96. And like every kid, wasn't real sure what I was going to do, but fell in love with medicine. So I pursued that in college. I died on a couple of waiting lists for nursing school and, and took the EMT track kind of got picked up with a local volunteer fire department here and and I've been associated with the fire department for the last 22 years. It's been awesome. Uh, I'm married, married my high school sweetheart. Wow. We're going on 19 years now. Seems like forever. Congratulations. And, uh, thanks, man. And I got a 17-year-old daughter, um, which comes with its own challenges, obviously. <laughs> All kids do. <laughs> but uh, hobbies, I do all the Colorado things. You know, we love the outdoors. We love to camp. Um, we love to fish. I hunt. Uh, I put a pool in the yard here a few years ago, and that's been a, a real mainstay for our summertime experience. That sounds and, pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Best investment you can make. And then I golf and I gamble, and that's about the size of it, man. That's good. Sounds pretty well-rounded. So how far are you from like your where you grew up to where you're working now full-time? Uh, it's about 45 minutes to Broomfield from where I'm at now. Well, it's pretty close, pretty close. So kind of, do you have like a funny time or a fun time that stands out in your life? Like something that just really stands out for you? It can be, it can be fire related. It can be personal life related. Oh man, that's tough. You know, the, on the fire side of the world, we, I like to link everything back to those big major milestones, you know, of, of getting hired for the first time. That was amazing. Surviving the professional academy. That was amazing. Uh, and then paramedic school. Those were kind of my three big benchmarks there. Uh, real recently, I promoted. That's That's been my latest and greatest benchmark. Um, and those have all been, been big moments in my life. On the personal side of things, uh, having my daughter was amazing. And, and that's probably one of my favorite moments. Getting married was amazing. And, and just experiencing all the change that comes with those two, are, it's awesome, man. Yeah, th those are massive changes in a person's life. Absolutely get it though as well. So that's awesome. What what's your what are you most passionate about? What the things driving you these days? Uh, you know I I love the fire service. I absolutely do. I think uh, my perspective on the business has changed over the last twenty plus years now. But uh, I'm super passionate about the fire service and what we do. I I absolutely love it. Um, and then I love really spending time on myself and my family anymore. And that's been a big change for me. You know, I, I was one of those guys that got swallowed up in the service pretty young and, and I spent every waking minute wrapped in some type of fire medicine, something, every t-shirt in my closet was blue. And <laughs> here in the last five years, I've really shifted to try and create more balance and, and capture some of those years with my daughter while I have them left and, and create those memories. You know, we went to the Bahamas last year and it was amazing. We're trying to get another big trip planned this year. Those are those are the things I really love. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, it's uh, it seems like every story I've heard so far, everybody really gets wrapped up right in when they start into the fire service. They just dive down just and try to gobble up as much information as possible. I don't know how we do it. I mean, I'm honestly trying to figure out why we do it. Um, you know, it's just it's kind of crazy that we we go just like you said, to that extreme. It is. I, I think it's part of our, our character and our personality within the business. The things that make a great firefighter are those ultra A type personalities, right? We take everything to the extreme. We, we don't go to work just to survive the shift and be okay at it. We want to be the very best. And every guy, every crew, every station, every department is striving for that elitism. And the only way to do that truly is to absolutely drown yourself and immerse yourself in the information, the tactics, the knowledge. And, and I think we, we sometimes lose sight of the other things that are important as a result of that. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, I know I have, and uh, it's you know it's like you said, you know, getting back to that balance. But definitely, it's so easy in the beginning, and so many of us just get lost in the beginning with with our personal lives and the lives outside of fire service. What I mean, why did you become a fire, first responder? What was the draw? You know, I, I fell into it by luck. Like I said, I really wanted to do something in the medicine world. My mom will tell you that I was the, the middle school counselor, you know, growing up as a kid, I wanted to deal with everybody's problems. So that was kind of a natural fit. But I couldn't get into medical school. I, I wasn't, I didn't come from a very wealthy family. So community college was my route. And uh, like I said, I tried to take the nursing track. That didn't work out. I figured you could get your EMT in a couple months and go to work. And that's what I wanted to do. I, I needed to make an income, obviously. So uh, I started down the EMT role and I couldn't get hired anywhere. I was struggling to get picked up. And my career advisor said, you ought to look at the volunteer fire service. You know, that'll give you some time in the street, give you some experience. I joined a local volunteer department here and fell in love with it. The, the camaraderie of the guys, it was a super close, super traditional old school volunteer fire department. Um, everybody carried the pager. They all responded from home. There were no employees. It, it was amazing. And that camaraderie and that brotherhood I fell in love with. And I knew from that moment on this, this was going to be my career and what I, what I did. Yeah. I, I, I too started out as a volunteer. So yeah, I definitely can relate with you. Um, it got so busy as a volunteer that it was just, I mean, we're running 10 calls a day as a volunteer and that is so tough. You know, constantly leaving, coming, going, and trying to, you know, fill those engines and ambulances. And yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it, it was awesome to start out that way. Great exposure. Absolutely. It was a cool time in the fire service. There, there were things we did back then, obviously, that are super frowned upon now. Right. But man, it's such an honor to be a part of that, that snapshot in fire service history. You know, I mean, we, we did things as volunteers that we struggle to force our paid guys to do now. You know, the level of commitment and work and ethic and, and character of those guys was second to none. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely the times have changed. The, the, the things that we did back then as volunteers, uh, yeah, I mean, that's over quite a while ago for me. You know, it's uh, definitely, it's frowned upon. It's not the things we do today. <laughs> but that's, I mean, all businesses is that way, right? Everything's changing. The, you know, the dynamics of the fire service is no different than the dynamics of, of any other service or business. It's always evolving. Absolutely. So uh, can you describe like a kind of a day in your life as a, you know, kind of what it looks like uh, getting ready to go to work and then going to work and then coming home kind of just like a, just what's, what's your day like? Typical day, I get up around five. Our shifts start at seven. I've got about a 30 minute commute to get to work. So I get to see my wife off to work typically in the morning. Um, I miss my daughter because she sleeps in, gets up much later. <laughs> Occasionally I'll catch her right as I'm leaving the house, but rarely. Um, I get to work about a half hour early. Uh, it's important for me to have all my, I'm very OCD, got to have my process. So I got to have all my stuff laid out in a particular way. I like uh, being able to relieve that off going lieutenant early so he misses that late call you know nothing worse than getting to the end of a 48 hour stint and grabbing one at 10 minutes to shift change you know oh yeah I so agree. uh i get that swapped out and then i like to check in with my guys you know see how their four day was kind of do a little mental checkpoint with them make sure their heads are in the game they're ready to go and then collect anything they might have for conference call you know i got guys that are involved in projects and they're working with students and doing fto stuff so i kind of gather my house information and uh and we do conference call first thing in the morning. We work 48 hour shifts. So typically there's a fire department training every set and company training each day of the set. Uh, we're also the hazmat station, like I mentioned. So we've got a lot of hazmat re responsibilities. We calibrate all the detectors for the city and we also wash all of the bunker gear for the entire city. Oh, wow. So it's a very busy project station. Uh, in addition to those pesky little nine one ones that come in, of course, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's great to have a plan to your day, um, but you know the nine one ones calls definitely really just change the whole shape of the day. I know they do. You can lay out the best plan first thing in the morning and be on about plan F by noon. Exactly, <laughs> the nature of the beast, you know. So yeah, then we run forty eight hour shifts. We got uh, two days together, and then we're off for four. So the 48s can be a long haul sometimes and, and just balancing that, trying to 
to manage the workload as well as the the other things that come down the pipe while you're on duty it's a challenge yeah so when you get at home kind of how's that play out and what's your when you when you go home and see your family are you able to catch them in the morning and have kind of a do you go to take a nap or how does that look you know and it depends because of that schedule you know it moves around throughout the week if i'm coming home on a weekend i usually get to get together with the girls they'll they'll get up mid-morning and, and we'll try and spend some time together if it's during the week i miss them both um and depending on the shift too if if we've gotten rocked for 48 hours typically my my first day off is a raging sprint back home to go to bed you know, <laughs> yeah. getting, trying to get dialed and ready for my four day because then you got household responsibilities to take care of too you know the the dishes don't don't stop the laundry doesn't stop there's there's things that have to be done so you can't just veg out for four days but yeah life never stops when you're gone and usually uh life something is happening at home when you're at work and trying to balance you know working and taking care of your home but not being able to be home for a couple of days it does make it rough absolutely you know my my wife gets to play head of household for two days out of every week you know she she's got to manage all the stuff while i'm gone and and that can be a big toll sometimes yeah I, I, I agree. It's, I see so many guys and I, I've you know been there personally myself is just things are falling apart at home, but you have to be at work. Like there's, you know, there's no way of really getting home to handle that situation until the end of your shift. So it's uh, your spouse or significant other has to be really independent in a lot of ways and be able to take care of the household when you're gone. I mean, and there's times you, you probably can't be reached for several hours and maybe even days, depending on what you're doing at work. Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, and our wives are our backbones, man. They're they're running our house. They're taking care of our kids. The water heater blows up. The the stove <laughs> explodes. Those type of things. They're they're on their own. You know, you can provide some tech support over the phone, obviously, but for the lion's share of it, they they've got to manage that. So they have to be super independent. Yeah, and it's uh, when and when they they're not. I see the guys really at work just really really suffer go through some super hard times and they're trying to manage both both spaces it's really difficult you know traditionally speaking there are things that we're supposed to be able to take care of and when you're gone a third of your life that's just not the case there's gonna those things are going to happen when you're away and, and there's going to be times when you're away and you're unreachable you know we're going to be on calls for hours we're going to have days that are busy and and you're right, it may be a very long time before you can even make that contact. And Beck relies heavily on our neighbors and some of our family friends to, to help fill that void while I'm gone. They have to. Yeah. I mean, how's, how does that weigh on you, on you mentally when those things are going on and you're trying to work? You know, it's hard. You know, you know when things are bad at home, it creates a whole other level of stress at work. And, you know, whether it's kids and discipline issues or grades or or those type of things when you're away, you can't do anything with any of that. You know, if my daughter blows her curfew time, my wife's dealing with that. I'm, I'm at work. Yeah. And, but you know that there's those struggles at home and, and you feel bad. You, you burden a lot of that guilt because you know that you can't handle these things. You know that you can't take care of them. And you're 50 miles away trying to, to function and do another job. And you know, you have to entrust that to your spouse and, and you wish them the best and hope that they, they do well and, and spend that time over four day trying to, to recover from the things that you missed. But it's yeah. hard. It, it's really hard. Yes. Uh, so do you, when you get home and you're trying to decompress from your, your busy day at work, and how does that, are, are you able to do that? I mean, you know, the stuff that you see and you do at work, how do you, how do you deal with some of that? You know I need time. Um, and I think this is fairly standard across the industry, but I tell my wife, if you want me to, to hear what you're saying or to, to pay attention to the to-do list, don't give it to me in the first couple hours. Because <laughs> I really think you need that reset time. You know, we spend as firefighters such a, an extreme amount of time at a heightened state of awareness. You know, we're constantly on edge. You're waiting for that alarm. You're waiting for the training opportunity. Whatever the case may be, we're just at that, that heightened level. And when we come home, we dip below a level where we can really communicate and function as human beings. We need that time to, to kind of reset, recover, and, and come back out. 
And that was something that was really critical for, for Beck to understand. And it's hard for her to understand. I've been gone for two days. She sees me the first minute she sees me, she wants to unload 48 hours of stuff on me. And mentally I'm just not ready to take it. I can't hear it. I don't understand it. You know, she tell me to take the trash out and three hours later, be like, did you take the trash out? She didn't tell me to do that. I didn't even hear her. You know, yeah. so I need that window of time to recover. Yeah, that's, that's understandable. I, I've never really thought of it that way, but it makes, makes good sense. I mean, I, I'm, I'm do the same kind of thing and just have to like take that burden away off your shoulders and just have the ability to relax. Because like you said, there's never the real opportunity to lower your level of, you know, that next call coming in, you know, that adrenaline type, you're always on that edge, just sitting there for 48 hours and yeah coming home you're sometimes you're just exhausted just from just being on that edge do would you did you guys ever do you ever get any training on how to like handle any of this type of stuff that maybe they're not going through just at work but at home like in, any anything the fire service or any tools anybody ever gave you to deal with this stuff you know not until the last three years um Three years ago, our organization really started to pursue the mental health and peer support ends of the industry and offer some of those education and services to our members and their spouses. And it was really kind of amazing, you know, that we bring a, a psychologist in to teach these sessions and we have nights where they do it with the entire family. It's awesome. It's amazing. But to have that that person stand up in front of the group and explain some of these things and help us understand why we are the way we are why I can't hear my wife when I come home first thing in the morning was phenomenal. Now it was 17 years before I received any of that information, any of that training. And I really think had I done it earlier in my career, the struggles that I had with my marriage wouldn't have been nearly as severe, but there's a huge component to the fire service. We spend so much time studying how to be good firefighters and what the fire service is all about. And we don't do a very good job of educating the spouses and the kids as to what that entails. And, and there's a big component of this that's truly about how the spouse survives this experience of being married or in, an, in a relationship with a firefighter. And there are definite things that are unique to our industry that, that we need to understand. And, and we haven't done a good job historically as a fire service of putting that information out. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like there has, not been much time spent on developing i call like emotional intelligence like we train to run calls and do all these other things but we have never really been trained to manage our emotions and to see the things we see and to deal with them like there hasn't been any training on and I'm, I'm super glad your department has stepped up and and done something most of my experiences i've you know i've done it alone kind of figuring out my own thing that works and digging deep into inside me, like how am I going to deal with these situations and not let them fester. But early on in our careers, I, that never occurred to me. You just try to suck it up and deal with it somehow. Absolutely. Most of us grew up in a fire service that that was the mentality. You'd run a, a, a terrible call and, and you'd look to the old timers and they'd tell you, you know, that was terrible, right? Yeah, that, that was really bad. You're going to have those. And you moved on to the next event. It's really just in the last five to 10 years, I think that within the American Fire Service, it's surfaced that our mental health is just as important, if not more so, than our physical health. And organizationally, we need to step up and really tailor to both facets if we want to make our firefighters resilient and, and create those long, healthy careers that, that are so important, not only to the organization, but to our members as well. Yeah, even even physical fitness is, uh, has been struggling to gain some momentum but recently, I guess in the last five years, it's starting to pick up some, but there's a lot of departments who really don't include that into their daily practices. And, you know, I, I feel those things go hand in hand, both physical and mental. You got to be doing both of them to keep your mind sharp and be able to handle these calls. You know, if you're not physically ready, you're not going to be mentally ready. And if you're not mentally ready, you're not going to be able to, you know, be physically do the job either. Absolutely. Do you see this type of stuff play out on your crews? Do you like, do you, when you're going through these bad calls and do you see that, what's your bond like with your crews when you're going through stuff like this? 
My company specifically, we're fortunate because we're really, really close. I've got a great group of guys working for me, um, and, and we're a tight knit group, so that helps. It, and it's also we're very fortunate that our department has stood up and said, you know, the mental health aspect of this is very important, and we've brought the the people who can teach the message and have the skill set in to address the entire department and say, you know what, you're going to have calls and it doesn't necessarily have to be the nasty, gruesome call that's going to be a trigger for you. It could be any call and you need to recognize these signs. This is what it looks like and this is what you're going to deal with. And these are the things you need to be hyper aware of and raising that awareness within our department, I think has created a culture where we're more apt to talk about it now. Um, we're more apt to come back to the station and not only say, you know, was that a bad call, but key into those little subtle details of how you're doing and, and recognize when a member may be struggling. And we've got resources in play to address those things now, which five years ago absolutely wasn't the case. We had EAP and, and I used EAP and it was terrible. Um, yeah. General clinicians that don't understand the fire service, don't know what we do, don't know what we see. And it just didn't work. Um, now we've got specifically trained psychologists on board that deal only with fire and EMS and first responders. Um, they understand the culture, they understand the calls, and our people are finally to the point of where they're not only willing to reach out to our peer support teams, but also to our clinical psychologists. And we have guys that meet regularly with our clinical psychologists to manage what this industry deals with. Is this something you facilitate as the being one of the, or you're the company officer, right? Correct. So is that something you facilitate or is that, or you're somebody on the crew is facilitating talking about this or how does that, how's that go about? So our administration really bought into the whole mental health thing and we created a system to where if an individual is struggling, they can contact anybody on the peer support team. Uh, we're a, we're a membership of about 120 people now, almost if you include our administrative staff and we've got 10 peer support counselors on the department. Those range in ranks from fairly new firefighters up through the level of battalion chief. And we've got a couple, we've got one administrative support staff specialist on board as well. So you've got a, an array of people you can reach out to if you're comfortable with that. We've also got a system in place where you can skip all of those people and 100% confidentiality wise, call our clinical psychologist and set up a meeting with them. Um, they're mandated to confidentiality. They don't report back to the department at all. We've got a specific budget every year that funds that and that clinical psychologist doesn't even report back to the team on who they're meeting with or how it's going. Uh, those are all options within our organization for our people. And for the that's most great. part, it's that's pretty great. well accepted. Yeah, that's uh, not many departments I think can say that, you know, they're doing as well as you're doing. That's great to hear. What, uh, do you have any, do you share things with your guys that maybe you don't share or with you when you go home? Is there a different kind of bond and connection to, to these crews? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I try to draw a really clean line between what happens at work and what happens at home. Because at the end of the day, there are things that my wife doesn't need, want, and shouldn't hear. Um, and looking for support from her in some of those aspects is not a good plan for us. Um, she's super supportive. Don't get me wrong. And she's a wonderful person. She's a saint. She's put up with me for longer than I've put up with myself <laughs> some days. But some of those things you have to vent within the crew and, and you have to lean on one another for that support and, and the dark humor and some of the, the firehouse antics. And it's really two separate worlds. You know, uh, we joke all the time that if, if the public or our families saw some of the things that we did and said in the firehouse, they would disown us. It's probably true. But there is two definite different families there and, and there's different levels of, of support and communication within each. Do you see the guys getting more vulnerable and, you know, willing to talk about these things and not having to, you know, let them fester and move, you know, go through their career with this just building and building of this mental stress on them? For the most part, I would say yes. There's still that adage that this is the American Fire Service and we are tough. We are bulletproof. Nothing bothers us. And, you know, when a guy truly hits that breaking point, it's, it's fragile, you know, and it's a vulnerable state. And there is still some stigma that goes out with the whole mental health side of things. And maybe you're not good enough or you're not tough enough to do this job. 
And I think we're still climbing and we'll always climb that hill. Um, I don't think that it'll ever be a, a purely transparent service to where guys are comfortable laying all their cards on the table. We also look for vulnerabilities within each other, right? If, if I can find your weakness, I'm going to give it to you, right? Right. Good, good way to, to give each other a hard time and to have fun and finding that line between where we're having a good time and where we're just riding a guy into a dark hole. That's, that's a fine gray, gray line there. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself in that dark hole before? Oh man. I, I look back over my career and there were a couple points in my career where I, I absolutely was done. Um, I was looking to get out of the fire service. I was looking to leave my own department and go do something different. And, and yeah, this job, it comes with an enormous amount of stress and responsibility. And at times guys all burn out. I, I describe all of our careers as a roller coaster. And you're going to go through those highs and you're going to get in those lows. And the, the key to success in this industry is how you climb out of those holes. And if you climb out of those holes and yeah, I think, I know that I've been there. I've been there on multiple points, you know, and, and my crews would tell you, yeah, Wes was applying elsewhere and Wes was going to do other things. And we didn't even think Wes was going to stick around um, because you hit those points, you know, whether it's, it's the calls or the programs or, you know, failed promotions were a big challenge that I faced. Um, and, and those were hard to come back from, you know, you start questioning and doubting your own skills, abilities, and knowledge and, and wondering if you're, in the right place you know and it's hard who did who did you lean on during those you know dark times in those in those deep holes like was there was there did you look to lean on somebody or did you lean on something else you know outside the fire career or how did how'd you pull yourself out you know it and you gather resources here, right? And surround yourself with good people. I had some really good friends outside of my department that kind of helped change the lens at which I saw my own organization through. That was a huge help. Um, when it rains, it pours, right? So in those times, I was also struggling at home. I was struggling in my marriage. Uh, I sought out EAP, as I, I mentioned earlier. I have spent significant time with personal psychologists trying to help me understand why I'm seeing things the way I'm seeing them and how to, how to change my perspective in order to try and change the outlook on what I'm going into. And, uh, and it, it was a collective effort. You know, I, I took some time away from work that helped, you know, kind of refocused and reprioritized my own life and looked at, I'm spending 90% of my time buried in the fire service and medicine my, my backup jobs, my part-time work is on an ambulance or in a college teaching fire and medicine. And I was burned out. I, I was absolutely overwhelmed and I never got a break. I never got away from anything that I did professionally. And that was hard. Uh, finding those balances and trying to create some better, better life choices was important. Uh, it was no secret too that... Uh, What's that? I was going to say, guys are doing that same thing all over probably the world, I, at least in America for sure. Like, who's not working a second fire job and are doing something that doesn't relate to the fire service? Almost everybody's doing that and are getting so burned out by doing that. Like, you're accelerating your burnout in your career incredibly faster by working all those other jobs than if you were just work one fire job. You'd be oh, way better off by working at a grocery store or something else, you'd, your career would be way better. Something I tell all of our new kids, and, and I believe it is one of my downfalls, but if you're going to do something, if you're going to have a skill set, do it outside of fire and EMS. Find something that A, you can fall back on if something happens in this career to where you can't do it anymore. You need a skill set outside of here. And you also need to be able to engage your brain somewhere else. You know, I would go six, eight, ten days in a row where I never turned off my fire or my EMS brain. I was either teaching it or doing it. And you're right, the, that accelerates the burnout. You, you absolutely become imprisoned in this mentality and this culture of the service, and it's not good for you. You think the, the roller coaster at, uh, at home and at work go hand in hand? Do you think either one, like, leads the other? You know... 
I know there's definitely times where they're related. And, and I would tell you that looking back, the hard times in my career were also very hard times in my marriage. I don't know that they're directly linked. I can think of times of where things at work were great and things at home were not and vice versa. But I definitely know that, that there are times when, like I said, when it rains, it pours. You know, you're struggling at work, you're struggling at home, your kid's driving you nuts and making terrible choices. And things just pile on and pile on and pile on. And that's what pushes a guy to his breaking point. You know, that's when we, we really hit those moments of, I can't do what I'm doing anymore. And you have to make drastic changes. Right. And those, at those points, a lot of people will make unhealthy decisions at those points when they're in those positions. Would, would you agree with that? Oh, I'd absolutely agree with that. Is there a, is there a, a way to maybe look at that, see that coming for a firefighter as a company officer? You know, I think you have to, to really be in tune to your guys and, and be personally invested in your guys. And, and what I mean by that is when I check in for a shift, I ask my guys how their four day was. It's not a blanket comfort question. I'm asking to, to gauge where they're at. And if I notice that, and I've got a guy right now that is working ridiculous hours, it's outside the fire service, but he's working every minute of his four day. I know I've got to stay a little more in tune to him and watch him more closely. If he starts making mistakes on the rig and starts making mistakes on calls, we have to, as a company officer, recognize that, pull those guys inside and sit them down and be like, Hey, this is just a checkpoint. What's going on? Where are you at? This is what I'm seeing. I'm worried about you. I care about you. I love you to death. And, and this is out of the norm and, and really invest in those guys by saying, you know, what's going on in, in your world? How are things at home? Are, are things with your kids going all right? I know you were struggling with this here last week. Did that resolve? You have to be in tune to that. That's, that's awesome that you do that. And I tried to do that to the best of my ability as well. You know, that it's a great gauge of how the day is going to go at work when I kind of know what's going on in their, in their home life. Do you, did, did you have company officers that do that with you before you became one company officer? I did. I had a couple of guys that were, at the time, I felt more invested in my personal life than my professional life. You know, they, they knew my wife, they knew my kids, they knew their birth dates, they knew the activities they were involved in. Most of our conversations related around what was going on outside of work. And looking back now, that was just their way of telling how I was going to perform at work and making sure that things were at home because they knew and they'd had other guys that if things at home were terrible, we've got to change our gauge at work a little bit and we've got to at least be sensitive to that. Now, I'm not going to give a guy a free pass all day, but if I know that, that you're going through a divorce or your kids are, are deep into drugs and, and driving you nuts at home, I can at least know that that's something that you're dealing with and something that you're struggling with and maybe not pile things onto your plate with that knowledge. Uh, and yeah, I had, I had one company officer in particular that was, I, I've stolen most of my stuff from him. He was just amazing at that. And when you talk about creating value in the service, you know, and value in your people, when you're invested in your people at that level, that, that's true to me. You know, there's, there's no denying that. It's not to take care of whether I'm, I'm good at work or I'm pulling the line or I'm doing the right things today. They, they cared about me as a person and as an individual. And, and that, that made me engage a whole lot more and work a whole lot harder because I, I can let you down at work occasionally, but I can't let you down personally. And it, it carried more weight for me. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I think those go hand in hand. Like you're, when somebody's invested in you and not just invested in you as a, as let's say an employee, but invested you plus invested in what's going on in your home life. I mean, it makes me want to work harder they know me, you know, they, and it makes conversation easier and we have that a great bond. And when you bond with somebody or bond with your crew, how hard do your crews work? They work extra hard. Like you said, nobody wants to let anybody down. So they work so hard for each other. And those are the best crews to be on when it's not that way. What, what happens? Yeah. Now we're just checking boxes and managing tasks, you yeah. know, it's like, yeah. what do you need me to do today, boss? And that's all I'm going to do. And then, leave me alone. You know, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. It's, you know, the fire service over the last, I don't want to say 10 years, it's been like, well, we got to start, start running like a business. 
you know, everything we're going to do, we're going to run like a business. And I'm like, yeah, but there's one thing we can't do in a fire service like a business can. For people, we are so people driven, not just, you know, on calls, but in our staff, like we live with each other for two days. I mean, a third of our lives are spent together. We can't like use people as numbers. They're not numbers. Everybody has their own unique circumstances and gifts to get to the fire department. Oh, absolutely. And really, even if you take it into the corporate world and you look at the super successful businesses, they're businesses that invest in their people. And if they treat their people not as assets, but as the true backbone of their industry, those businesses thrive. Look at what Google's done as a prime example. You know, if we can adopt that mentality, and you're right, a third of our lives, we're together. You can't just treat them as a coworker, as you know, some colleague that you pass in the hall once a week. We eat together, we sleep together, we train together, we bleed together, we cry together. That's a very unique, unique relationship and circumstance. Yeah, and it'd be great to start seeing some of these things from these top Fortune 500 companies coming into the fire service, just making the employee feel more valuable and they will, when they feel that, they will perform for their patients, their crew on the fire ground. Their performance will be better because right now it, it's so easy to get burned out in this job, especially if you're a guy riding on the ambulance and taking all those calls constantly. You, when you're not feeling valued, what do you, what do you think your empathy level is going to be out of your employee? Oh, absolutely. It's next to none. And, we are a business. It's never going to change. You can spend all the money in the world on the best trucks, the best equipment, the best training in the world, but you've got to have the people to carry out the mission. Our most valuable asset is our people, and we can't lose sight of that. And it's a tough time. I don't know about in Colorado, but in Utah, it's a tough time right now. People don't want to be first responders. Yeah, Colorado, we're way short, too. They, uh, they published here about six months ago. We're down 400 paramedics. And the staffing is short, budgets are tight. We rode the coattails of 9-11 for as long as we could. And now we're really battling with the city for money against street sweepers and cops and patrol cars. And it's not the, the budgets aren't unlimited anymore. And we're really having to justify what we do with fewer people and fewer stations. It's, it's brutal. Yeah. And it's, I think it's going to start showing the wear and tear on the people soon enough. If it already hasn't, I'm sure it's depending on the department that you're at, no matter, you know, if you're police, fire, military dispatcher, whatever, we're all going through the same things and you can only ride a person so hard and get so much of a high performance out of them before they, you can't ride them anymore. And Absolutely. I think the days of doing 40, 50 years in this industry are long past and, and especially out in this side of the world, we need to start looking back East and, you know, a lot of those guys are still 20 and done out there. They'll do 20 years and, and they're retired regardless of their age. Uh, because of the frequency, we're running more calls today than we ever have. We're doing it with less resources. The demands are higher. The stress is absolutely higher. The, the days of doing this for 40 years, those are, those are a thing of the past. Yeah, and the right, the cancer rates are going up and up and up and in the fire service. We are, we know mental health is a huge thing like we've been talking about, but more firefighters and police officers lose their lives to suicide than in the line of duty. That is terrible. Absolutely. I sat in a conference back in January out in Los Angeles. There's probably 125 people in the room and they asked everybody who knew somebody that had been affected by suicide to stand up. And they went down the list, one person, two person, three person, four person, or four people that had either committed suicide or you knew that had committed suicide within the service. And the amount of people standing was mind boggling. This, this is an absolute pandemic that we're dealing with and we've got to respond to it. Yeah, it, it gives me chills. It, it's, just, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, we can't get people into the service and then the people that we get into the service we're breaking them. Absolutely. And when we break them, we're not taking very good care of them. This mental health thing is uncomfortable for us. It was really uncomfortable for our department for a long time. Of When we started this, we were so afraid nobody was going to seek out help and nobody was going to come talk to us. This was going to be a flash in the pan project. 
and over before it started. It's absolutely not the case. And our peer support team has doubled in the last couple of years just to meet the needs of our organization. And I think there is a growing need out there. Um, we're fortunate the Greeley Fire Department hasn't had any members lost to suicide, but I have friends in departments all over the country that have, and their stories are horrific. They'll absolutely bring you to tears. And it's a terrifying thought as a company officer thinking, are we doing enough? Am I doing enough to take care of my people to prevent that? Yeah, I had a, had a good friend who got hurt in the line of duty and ended up having to get medically retired out of the system after being hurt on duty. And just like most all of us, we have one identity and that's being a fireman. And once that was taken from him, oh my gosh, the, the wheels fell off the wagon. It, I mean, it, to tell his story would just bring me to tears. It's just a slow decline over two years. And then, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the meds and stuff that he was taking and everything just caught up to him. Absolutely. Um, I, I can completely relate. One thing that we don't do a good job of in this industry is preparing people to get out of it. And, and we should start that day one with our new guys. This is the job and I love it. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love what I do, but I also know that I may not be able to do this forever. I blew my knee out on a fire in 2011 and, and that was really the first big chink in my armor where I realized I wasn't bulletproof. I, I, I was vulnerable. I wasn't going to be able to, to beat everything that was thrown at me. And when you have surgeons looking you in the eye telling you, you may never fight fire again, that weight and that pressure that hit me of knowing that I don't have any other skills. I, I can't just go do something else tomorrow. It was terrifying. I see that same fear in a lot of our retirees, our guys in their last five to six years of, of employment going, I don't know what I'm going to do after this, you know, and I don't know what the future holds. I, all I know is being a fireman. And that's yeah. part of this, you know, drowning in the business as we do and absolutely submersing ourselves in everything that we, we want to become and want to study. We have to know that there's balance here and, and we have to create some ways for these guys to get out and to get out healthy. There has to be vision after the fire department. When your career is over, you have to have somewhere to go, something to do. I'll never forget one of our retired chiefs came to me two weeks, three weeks after his retirement. He said, Chief, how's retirement, man? Is it awesome? Is it everything you dreamt it to be? And the guy was crushed. He looked at me with blank, soulless eyes and said, you'll never understand until you get there. But at the minute your party's over, you're no longer a firefighter. I had no email to check today. I had no guys to hang out with. There was no rig to check. And I'm lost. I don't know what to do. Yeah, you're going from right one, having two families, you know, and your work family is always growing and changing, and your your home family is, but it's not a changing and growing as, as fast. And so, yeah, you cut your family in half, and then you're stuck with a lot of alone time, and you're like, okay, what do I do with my alone time? And next, I've only known this one thing my entire life. And there's something I didn't know about you. We share actually the same, it's a very similar story. I hurt my knee and it was out 500 days. And I was faced with, you're never going to be a fireman again. You're just not going to be able to do it. It's terrifying. That, that crushed me. That sent me into a terrible downward spiral where I, one night was, you know, I was like, this is the end. I'm done. Like, everything in my world is collapsing on me. Once you start down that slope and there's no one around to, to pull you back up and maybe there are people around, you're just not reaching up to grab their hand and you're starting sliding down, man, I found myself just with, you know, handful of pills and ready to do it. And luckily I, you know, I, part of my story is that my dad stepped in. I just heard his voice and, you know, say, Hey Jerry, it's not time. Everything will work out. And I, I didn't take the pills. And I was like, you know, when I was in the process of, you know, going to take those pills, everything, all the calls you've ever been on and ever seen. And we know all this stuff, right? We've seen it. We've dealt with it on every level. 
but yet here I am, I'm finding myself in that same exact situation. Absolutely. And we're a little insensitive in the service because an injury is a huge hit to a guy. You know, I, I look back when I was on light duty and it's all in fun, right? We're, we're asking the light duty guy and how's delivering the mail because we have such a purpose when we're on the line. We fulfill such a divine calling and a unique mission. But when you're not on the line, you know, whether you're retiring out, you have a medical injury that sidelined you for a while, you have a mental injury that sidelined you for a while, those guys tend to get treated so much differently. And it adds to that depression. It adds to the, the stress and the struggle of what you're dealing with. And it's like, yeah, I guess my only purpose here now is to deliver the mail and the chief's coffee. And that's cool. And it's hard. We devalue those things and we put so much pride and ownership into to be in that guy, you know, that, that has the knob, that, that responds to the fires, that responds to the cardiac arrests. When you take that away or when you can't do that, it's a huge burden to carry. Yeah. It's getting that, you know, the carpet ripped out from underneath your feet and falling down and like looking how to get up. Because I was like, I don't know how to do anything that doesn't involve me for one being healthy and two being in the police and fire service. I don't know how to do anything out of that. And if I'm not healthy, how am I going to be a police officer or a firefighter, you know, or all these other things that I like was banking on, you know, I'm going to retire and I'm going to do this, but they were just derivatives of, you know, the police and fire service. So yeah, you're just like, you're totally lost. Like, nowhere to go. Like how am I going to earn an income? It's, those are not great days to be, unprepared for no not at all and it's a reality of our business right we talk about a firefighter injury but it's like yeah firefighters get hurt it's a very physically demanding job they're in very precarious situations and environments at all times and of the day and night it's no secret that they get hurt and again be it a, a physical injury like my knee or you have a guy struggling with a mental injury where he's just hit that burnout stage or he's overstressed recognizing that that strips their identity from them and how critical that is to, to take care of and to respond to. That's a big piece of our industry, you know, and on the mental health side of things, I think it's even harder because those guys get the stigma of being crazy, right. And broken. Yeah. He can't mentally hack the job. And I don't know if he's going to have a mental breakdown when he's on my crew. And, and we add all these things because the mental side is a little unknown, but just like my knee, when I hurt it, the city rehabbed me. They got me back to work. They, they gave me physical therapy. I'm going to have surgery at some point. There's this process to, to nurture a physical injury. When it's a mental injury, we should treat it the same, but we rarely do. Yeah. It's just because it's so, so new in the fire service to actually look at that because everybody was just okay before, no matter what they seen or did there, everybody's of course, everybody's going to be okay. Like nobody was not okay is what the feeling was. Any regrets being a first responder? You know, looking back, my one major regret is I wish I would have had somebody grab me by the throat and help me learn to balance my life a little better earlier. Uh, my daughter was raised in a volunteer firehouse for seven years. Um, and, and again, I was just, that's all I did. You know, I was always at the station. I always had meetings. I always had trainings. Um, and at the time my wife was working nights. So I took my daughter with me. She grew up in that station. Uh, when I went to Greeley, I wish somebody would have slowed me down and said, you don't have to be on every team. You don't have to take every class, you know, take a break. I, uh, my biggest regret is I, I missed about nine years of my kid's life that, that I'd give anything to have back. Because time's the one thing that, that you can't work hard enough to replace. Um, and, and I regret that. I, I really do. I don't feel that my daughter and I are as close as we should be now uh, because I was always at work. You know, I was either at work or at a class or you know, doing something for the department. And I missed a lot of her activities because of that. Yeah. Yeah, even those volunteer days that people really don't understand, you know, how much time and dedication those volunteers do. And, you know, you, you, you probably heard this before is people say, I'm just a volunteer. I'm like, no, that is a huge deal to be a volunteer. That is a huge sacrifice at your time. And also people don't volunteer anymore. So yeah. the volunteer fire service is fading away too to communities with no one to respond. 
yeah, it's almost extinct up in this area, whereas 20 years ago, all of the departments were volunteer. But you're right. Those were days of carrying a pager, and at any minute's notice, you left. A lot of times, I think that we translate our career stuff the same way, right? Like the overtime call goes off or page goes out and nine guys are running in or second alarm fires. You're leaving birthday parties. You're leaving Christmas. You, you're leaving these important events and, and sacrificing that for the job. And I just, I don't feel like I had it figured out very well and I didn't do a good job of balancing my home life and my professional life at all. And, and if I could take anything back, I, I'd give anything to have that time back. Amen, man. I'm, I'm with you. you. Made those same exact mistakes. And I know uh, a lot of people listening are going to be feeling the same exact way. On the flip side, what's your greatest accomplishment as a first responder? Oh, man, that's tough, too. You know, and I've had so many good things happen throughout my career that it's hard to pin down just one. Um, lately, obviously, I'm absolutely ecstatic that I promoted it's always been a dream of mine to, to have my own company and to be able to run my own guys and run my own house. And, and I am loving that right now. You know, there, there have been some other high points in my career. I've done some, been involved with some really cool projects as far as the, the bunker gear for our department. I was able to be intimately involved in that and get everybody a second set of gear, bring everybody into compliance. Um, we made some big leaps there. Um, Two, three years ago now, I got to deliver twins. That was awesome. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, like a once-in-a-lifetime call, right? Uh, so you have those those high points that, you know, remind you that this is what the business is all about and, and that this really is the coolest job in the world. And, and there are so many good things that happen to us on a daily basis. Sometimes we get lost in the the negativity and the, the kitchen table talk, if you will. But uh but if you really sit down and put put value to what we do day in and day out, it, it's amazing to, to get four guys to jump on that rig and go into an unknown situation and solve a problem for someone they've never met. That's that's a great calling. It's an amazing privilege to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's uh, Being a company officer has probably been one of my greatest uh, struggles and one of my greatest rewards you know going through those struggles maybe the person i am today i'm not saying i'm the greatest company officer by any means but there are things that i would definitely would pride myself in you know as being a company officer that i'm proud of that i i do those things maybe different than somebody else does them and we all need that i mean there's the other company officers they all have their special talents too oh what, absolutely what uh, what would our listeners like? What's the thing that our listeners could take away from you? What would be the one thing you'd want to leave them with? You know, really, be careful how we spend so much time getting people into this industry, right? Spend some time, seek out some good mentors of various age within the organization to figure out how to survive this this industry as well. Um, create some balance in your life don't lose sight of the important sides of things don't lose sight of your family don't lose sight of the things at home and don't volunteer for everything right out of the gate find that one quirk that you're passionate about that thing within the fire service that that you absolutely love and go for it with all your heart but don't get involved in 19 different programs committees and, and groups it, it takes too much and, and remember at the end of the day this is a job. We need to spend just as much time preparing to get out of this industry as we do getting into this industry. And whether that's retirement or having that forethought of what if I get injured? What if I can't do this job anymore tomorrow? And understanding that that's a very real case that it, that very well may happen. Um, we hope that it doesn't. I want everybody to have long, healthy careers out there. But the reality of it is sometimes we're not meant to do this for 40 years. And you have to have a plan B. Have a All skill right. that gives you something to do that with. I'm going to put you on the spot. What's your plan B? My plan B? Oh, man. I want to win the Powerball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you, I've, my fallback has always been teaching and always, always in the fire and EMS side of things. But I'm starting to venture out, do things like this a little bit more and, and talk to people. And, and I've considered some consulting type stuff. Um, but I was fortunate young in my career. I had a guy really get with me and, 
and show me some investment stuff and, and get me prepared to maybe not have to work all the way to the finish line. Uh, on target, I, I should have 33 years in this industry when I retire and, and I'm looking to go early. I want to have the option to go at 50. Um, so we'll see. I don't, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but I, uh, I know that if I absolutely had to, uh, I could go to teaching and, and that I think would be far enough away from the service that I wouldn't drown in it anymore. But again, I did a poor job coming up. I don't have another skill set, Jerry. This is it for me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. I feel you. How, so to wrap this up, how is being a first responder, like how's that shaped you as a person and, and, and your life? Man, I think there's a couple things to, to discuss here. And one, I think it understand that, especially when you've been in this business for any length of time, it changes your view on society and the world. I, I really feel bad for my daughter <laughs> because I've had to raise her through those eyes of seeing the worst of people all the time. You know, when she started driving, it, it was so hard for me to throw her the keys and turn her loose and do that. Just because when we see teenage drivers, they're in a ditch or in a pile of metal somewhere. Understand that, that this industry is going to change your perspective and how you, the lens you see the rest of the world through. Um, and really keep that in touch. You know, know that, that you're going to have to do things. You're going to have to make time for yourself to be normal, to not be a first responder, to, to come home and be a good husband. Don't run your house like a firehouse. I think we're all guilty of that at times, you know. It's like, here's the, here's the duty list. Here's the watch list. This is what's going to happen today. And my wife tells me all the time, stop talking to me like I'm dispatch. <laughs> it doesn't work here. <laughs> so, I love that. I, I'm sure I'm guilty of that as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. Like here's the chores list. You're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. It's not your firehouse, Wes. Yeah. Um, understand that you have to create that separation and, and that's super important. This is a great job, but it's just a job. It's a job we do. Do it well, do it with all your heart, but be able to come home too. I, man, this has been a great talk and I appreciate you just being open and honest about everything that that's really gonna, you know, help our, our listeners maybe make the decision to be a first responder or maybe make the decision not to be a responder or you know if they are a responder to look at their lives and look at what's going to happen next and some self realization of this is a job that we do need to go to our home to our families and we need to go to our home to our families you know in a right state of mind you know they deserve that and it's on us partially to train ourselves to do that. So I, I do like the, you know, the thing coming home and, and decompressing. And I hope some people use that. Um, maybe it's for some guys going to the gym or doing whatever they're really passionate about for a little bit and coming home, man, that probably would save a lot of marriages. You think about it. All of us get in the mindset to go to work, right? We have our morning routine. We, we get our head right. We, we have a plan. We plan to go to work and engage in that atmosphere. We need to come home the same way we need to understand it's time to take that hat off and we don't have to control every aspect of our lives when we get home and we don't need to talk to our wife like we do dispatch we don't need to run our families like we do our crews and we need to prepare for that if that means taking a couple hours at the gym or taking a taking a longer drive home sitting at a park and getting focused and getting set to come home and engage as a husband and a father and a spouse then do it it's critical we're, we can never go from one to the next without some type of break between it. You know, you're not going to wake up out of bed and stop being a family man, go to work and be engaged hundred percent. There's a process there. We have to appreciate and respect the process of coming home too, and know that our family needs us to be the husband and, and the father, not the Lieutenant or the firefighter. Wes had some great information. I personally liked his preparation going to work and his preparation coming home. Wow. You know, I had never thought about prepping before I came home, like the way he mentioned in this episode. I get ready for work, and you have to be ready for work when you walk in that door. But you also have to be ready to engage in your family in a loving way as soon as you walk through your door at home. I don't care what you do for work. You can take those two tips away from Wes and implement them in your life. And I guarantee you, you will notice a change. 
please thank our sponsor, Fire and Fuel Apparel, and also follow us along our journey at the various different platforms you can catch this podcast. Thank you.